Hello there, welcome to Brian Lomax Movie Talk. Uh, I have had a bit of a, a bit of a, a week. Um, <laughs> uh, so I've slipped a disc in my back, which has been a common problem in recent years. Uh, when it goes, it's quite painful, must be said. Uh, and yeah, so I'm quite incapacitated. I'm also quite drugged up right now, so I may appear not quite as lively as I usually am. I don't know, uh, but it, but anyway, yeah, I'm uh, yeah, I'm lying on the floor, pretty much in my living room, and I've thought, you know what, I'm gonna crack on some Hammer films. So I'm I'm this is. I don't know how many of these I'm going to do because I don't know how long I'm going to be in this condition. But while I am in this condition, I, I yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna lie here. I'm gonna watch my hammer box set. Uh, well, it's not my hammer box set. It's actually my brother's hammer box set, um, which I've borrowed off him. Uh, so yeah, I'm not gonna go through them in order. I think I'll probably just hit them as and when I feel like them, depending on what my mood is. For this one, I'm gonna call it. I'm gonna call these Hammer Time. Yes, that sounds good to me. Welcome to Hammer Time. Uh, first one up on the chopping board is Quatermass and the Pit. I've got my phone here with the letterbox details because in my present state, I, there's no way I'm remembering all this stuff. But uh, yeah. Uh, Quatermass and the Pit, it's a 1967 film, it's directed by Roy Ward Baker, it's written by Nigel Neal, who wrote the original uh, teleseries for the BBC, uh, it, was, it was originally a, a yeah, BBC television thing, um, now Hammer did make a film version of this before they they remade the, the BBC thing already uh, Nigel Neal was not happy with it at all he hated it in fact um, and from what I gather they came back and they did this one which he was a lot more happy with they worked more to his uh, script his original script and yeah so it did a better better job of it by all accounts uh, now I've not, never seen any of the other Quatermass films or tv series or whatever they have been quite a few this is the first one uh, that i've seen so i'm coming to it without any kind of uh other context really you know i'm, I'm not comparing it to anything that i've seen before i'm taking it purely on its own merits so take that as you will uh so it stars james donald Andrew Keir plays uh, Professor Bernard Quatermass of the title. Uh, we've got Barbara Shelley and Julian Glover. They're the, the actors I recognise from it. Um, Duncan Lamont as well. He's worth a mention. He had a rather amusing role in it. But yeah, so there, there's, there's the main bunch. Uh, it, the, the story follows this unearthing of a essentially a ufo um a, some kind of spacecraft that it's re revealed that it comes from mars at some point um truth be told a lot of the science in this or the uh the the, the evidence that is unearthed by quatermass himself a lot of the the theories that are put forward are a lot of conjecture it must be said uh considering this is <clears throat> regarded as one of those films that you know is it's very deep in the science and that kind of thing this main character for me i have some trouble with uh because he's pe he's the he's the science guy you know he's the one who he's, he's full of all the theories about evolution and things like that he's painted as very rational he's the only rational one it seems um, except for the odd other character that, it, that that believes in everything he says and goes along with what he says and, and, and yeah so basically evolutionist rational anyone with any other kind of thought patterns not so much um, it kind of fits in line with that 
planet of the apes kind of mentality that was around at this time. I mean, Planet of the Apes weren't too long before this, from what I gather. It may have even been after. I don't think so. It was it was around the mid sixties, I think. Um, but yeah, it, it's of that. It's of that period. It's of that ilk. Um, so yeah, whatever. Um, however, you know what I will say about it that I did like is the the slow kind of build up of it um, in which things are revealed and they build tension, a, a fair amount of tension given, as I say, given, given the time this is from 1967, it, it, it's, it has dated, you know, the effects work in it particularly has dated. So the, the aliens that they pull out of the ship, these kind of, they look like giant grasshoppers, really, um, a giant locust. Uh, they're, they're paper mache, really. They, they look like some kind of art project that you might have done as a child at school. Um, I'm sure they were terrifying in the day, but certainly not, not now. Uh, there is some nice effects work at the end of the film uh, in which this thing appears. By that point, I've kind of lost track as to what's going on, to be perfectly honest. Um, yeah, there's some kind of invasion. So this, this ship has been laid dormant for thousands of years, um, maybe even millions of years, who knows. Uh, and it's only through their digging it up that it's kind of unearthed now, this, this force, this alien force that is going to get up to all kinds of business and take stuff over. There is a plan at the end that is kind of very quickly spoken out uh, with regards to this crane. So they're going to do something with this crane to to stop this, this alien thing, this presence, this force. And I'm not entirely sure what it was they were going to do because whatever it is they were going to do does seem to have worked because at the end that the force seems to be gone. However, I don't really see that what happened on screen was the plan that was laid out to us. Because <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't know, it, it seems to me like this guy was gonna go up on the crane and swing it round to create some kind of lightning rod for it or something but instead he, he doesn't really do a right lot he gets up onto the crane starts walking across it and then it falls down into this alien presence anyway and, and stops it that way so the guy wasn't really needed when you think about it so yeah the, the whole plan at the end uh, and the way it's executed the way it's portrayed on screen a little bit head scratching, a little bit confusing as to what they were trying to achieve there. You get the sense they achieved it, but not necessarily the way they intended. Um, so yeah. Um, so other characters in this, the, the Julian Glover character, he plays this soldier who is you know tasked with leading the the, the excavation, so to speak, uh, trying to find out whether it's an old bomb that's that's not gone off. Um, that's why he's brought in originally. And he just flat out refuses to believe anything that Quatermass is theorizing, even though a lot of the stuff, you know, is pretty blatant, it's smacking him in the face. They've just pulled these alien creatures out of the thing and he still refuses to believe what it is. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's a bit ridiculous, quite frankly. It just goes back to that, like what I was saying with, you know, yeah, there's, 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 there's no other theory that is put forward other than Quatermass's theory by anyone who who doesn't sound completely irrational and come off as stupid. Um, and this guy is one of them. Um, uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, Julian Glover, I believe, has been in a Bond film. I think, I think it was For Your Eyes Only. I think he played the villain in For Your Eyes Only. I liked him here uh, for, for what he gave. I am not, not necessarily sure I like the way his character's always written, but I like Glover as an actor in, in this film. 
someone else that I liked, and I'm going to just quickly check it on my phone because my head has just done a bit of a brain fart, uh, is Bar Barbara Shelley. So, yeah, I liked Barbara Shelley in this. I thought she was good. She was a nice on-screen presence. I don't know that I've seen her in anything else before. I could quickly check that, couldn't I? But I'm, I'm pretty sure that I've not. Um, let's see. I, yeah, she's been in a, a Dracula Prince of Darkness, which I have seen. Uh, a few other things. Blood of the Vampire I may have seen. I don't think so, though. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, she's been in a Dracula film that I've seen. So, so I look forward to seeing her in other stuff, I think, because I like to hear like the, uh, her presence, like I say. Um, the story is an interesting one. Uh, I, I, you know, I do think that it does, it does come from that period, like I say, where evolution has been pushed and and like the more spiritual element was kind of being pushed out. But the film does kind of raise the question that if life here on Earth, human life here on Earth, was started by aliens, who gave the aliens life? You know, it's it's like trying to remove the creator without acknowledging that the alternative that you're putting in place would still require a creator of some sort. So yeah, again, that's just my own uh, faith beliefs coming into play there. But when you have a film that discusses these kind of issues, depending on what side of the fence you're going to sit on, it's hard for that to not come into play. Uh, but other than that, I, I, like I say, I, I like the atmosphere, I like the slow build tension, I like the performances. Um, it's a good story idea that kind of puts forward some, some interesting ideas that provoke discussion. Uh, I just think that there are times when it gets a bit confusing, there are times when the special effects are definitely dated, uh, there is time when some of the the more supernatural elements of it are a bit hokey, a bit wooden, a bit weird. Like this one one point where the, the ship just starts blowing a load of wind out and wherever this guy goes that has just come out of it, the wind seems to follow him. It's a bit, a bit bizarre, really. Um, it, it, it's, it's not the most threatening of things. That's That, I guess, is what I'm... What I mean by that, it's like, ooh, a gale. Oh no! Ah! So, in that respect, yeah, not that scary. Uh, but the guy, the guy from that scene that I was talking about is, um, as I say, uh, Duncan Lamont. So he, he, he plays this guy who, who basically turns up with his drill. He's going to try and drill a hole through this... this wall in the ship and he's a bit of a talker too much of a talker given that he's involved in top secret government <laughs> undercover projects um a moment that he's actually called out in the film as well which is quite amusing in an exchange between him and glover's character um so yeah i, I liked this guy just because he doesn't shut up he's, he's a bit of a jibber jabber he's a bit of a cockney wide boy you could imagine him being a taxi driver uh you know so uh yeah so he, he was quite amusing. Um, but I think about that about covers it. Uh, I would give it a three out of five. I, I think given how much I've heard over the years about Quatermass and the Pit, and I know that mostly that does relate to that original BBC television drama, not necessarily this one. Um, but, but as I say, given what I've heard over the years about how much of a classic it is and and how groundbreaking it was. Um, this film, to me, feels a bit more average than than special. Um, it's good, it's solid, uh, it's a three out of five from me. Uh, so yeah, I, I think I probably wanted more, expected more, given its reputation. Uh, but like I say, that, that reputation is probably borne out more from the BBC one, not on this one. Uh, but yeah, three out of five from me, but what about you? Have you seen Quatermass and the Pit, the 1967 version? If so, 
comment below let me know what your thoughts are on it uh, thanks for watching this video and join me again pretty soon when i'll be reviewing another one of these hammer films in hammer time uh, yeah thanks for watching until next time cracking